Let's go back to 1984. Such a great year. I was only six years old at that time, but I remember 1984 very vividly. Specifically for a few things. And one of those things being a certain movie that was released in 1984. That changed my life. That almost introduced me to this thing called hip hop. And it wasn't even called hip hop back then. It was a movie called Breaking. I'm sure you've heard of it. Breaking and you just don't stop. Here comes the movie that's fresh and hot. Turbo and Ozone. It's a classic movie and it's one of the earlier memories of my life that I remember. So today I'm going to discuss Breaking. Y'all remember it. Classic movie. But let's talk about 1984 a little bit first. 1984, if you are alive at that time, you are blessed. You are a lucky person because 1984, as a kid, was dope. Cartoons, I mean, we had Voltron, Heathcliff. That was one of my favorites. Y'all remember Heathcliff the cat? GoBots, Transformers. Transformers. Do y'all kids think Transformers is this new thing? You know, they just started making the movies like 20 years. Nah, dog. Transformers was huge when I was a kid. And in 1984, there was nothing bigger than Transformers. I mean, Pink Panther. We had a lot of dope cartoons. If you're about my age, comment down below. What cartoons do you remember from the early 80s. I mean, 1984 even had some of the best music albums to be released. And one of those albums, which made me fall in love with music, was Thriller, Michael Jackson's Thriller. But 1984, we had, I mean, Bruce Springsteen, I mean, Madonna, obviously Run DMC. Hip hop was still very new, so we weren't hearing a lot of hip hop on the radio. When I would hop in the car with my mother, they, they weren't playing hip hop on the radio. They're playing pop. You know what I mean? 1984, the cars, you know what I'm saying? Rush, Twisted Sister. Like these are things that they were playing on the radio. Cool in the gang. That was about as close as it got to rap or hip hop. In fact, when I first was listening to cool in the gang i didn't understand rap slash hip-hop so i kind of got them confused i got funk confused with hip-hop and then i just started slowly studying the art form and the music and i was like oh man so cool in the gang was one of my early early introductions to music and michael jackson's thriller i mean some of the tv shows we had in 1984 doesn't get much better than the Cosby show. Shout out to Bill Cosby. Uh, Miami Vice. Come on, dog. Night Court. And these shows ran for years. So even if I didn't understand them at that time, I was able to watch them four, five, six years later and get the jokes. Charles in Charge. Y'all remember Charles in Charge? Charles in Charge of our days and our nights. Charles in Charge of our wrongs and our rights. What were your favorite tv shows growing up as a kid comment down below but today it's about 1984 and more specifically the movie breaking the ultimate show with Kelly Ozone and Turbo. i had the honor to interview michael boogaloo shrimp who played turbo in the movie my favorite character personally i wanted to be like turbo man his moves were everything to me it was fantastic and even watching it today as an adult, it's still amazing some of the moves that he was making. I wasn't really a big Ozone fan when it came to the dance style. I remember as a kid thinking he was cool because he got all the girls or whatever. He got the white chair, you know, stuff like that. But I never really dug his style. You know what I mean? Like the helicopter windmill, like all that. I never dug his style. But I think <clears throat> them together in that movie was... A perfect blend. It was great. It showed both styles and it showed two different characters. I remember the script. We had an agent. Uh, the script came out where they said that they wanted uh, 
uh, Turbo and Ozone, and Turbo and Ozone, they didn't really define whether they were brother or where he was like my surrogate dad or whatever. They just said they were just two guys in the neighborhood that just used their talent just to just kind of like be accepted and get by. Ward, it's the recognition of my peers that makes all those agonizing days of teaching Ozone everything I know. That's yeah, I don't want to stay here all night, do you? Award winners don't push brooms. Oh, yeah, I want you to go out and sweep, man. Who do you think you are anyway, Fred Astaire? Who? Little campy, little corny at times, right? We can all, as adults, we can admit that. It was a little campy, it was a little corny, but when I was a six-year-old, there was nothing like this movie from the beginning to the end. I mean, the broom scene, the broom scene is legendary, ladies and gentlemen. The broom scene by Michael Boogaloo Shrimp, a.k.a. Turbo. When I was a kid watching that, I was amazed. And then I even remember watching it later, you know, and, and I remember seeing the strings as the uh, quality of the video or the DVD got better. You would actually see, oh, that was strings. But I remember watching that grainy ass VHS video that I would rent down the street from such and such video blockbuster i don't know what it was john's videos we had so many video places back then but i would take it home and you couldn't see the strings that was actually an accident man i was once i got the job i was messing around on stage on the set and the director and the producers happened to be seeing me it was through a break i was balancing the broom on my finger and i was floating in place they were looking at me and i'm like oh, oh dude do i have the right deodorant what's up they got a prop guy and they drilled, they drilled with a drill bit, they drilled a hole in the center of the, of the broom. Then they got some fishing string and put on my, my finger, and they said, okay, play with it. I remember going to run videos. See, once again, something these kids, man, I'm getting nostalgic here, guys. When I was a kid, there was nothing like renting videos. Going out on a Friday or Saturday, you know, your mom would take you, whoever would take you. They would rent what they want, and then you would rent what you want, and then you'd watch a movie. I was watching Nightmare on Elm Street in 1984. That's another one. I was six years old. I, I would go to sleep to Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, I'm a little weird. I'm a little weird. But I would go to sleep to Nightmare on Elm Street. But there was nothing like going to the video store, man. Maybe getting some licorice or some ice cream or something there and taking it home and just enjoying it oh man you kids don't understand now everything you don't even leave the house and i get it i enjoy i don't even i don't like going to the movies anymore movies I, i'm good on the movie I, I like if i'm gonna watch a movie i want to watch it from my home i'll pay to watch it from my home i can drink i can toke whatever i want like I, i'm good on going to movie theaters and spending damn near 25 dollars per person for a ticket and no and i'm good I don't care about all the reclining seats and all that stuff you have. Nope, nope, I'm good. I would rather watch it from my home. But back then, it was nothing like going to the video store. And you kids don't know about the video store, man. If you're under 30, you probably don't know about the video store. But it was such a good time. And breaking is one that I would always, always rent. I was always at the video store renting breaking. Like I would, if there's one movie I rented more than anything as a kid, it was it was it had to be breaking. I can't think of another movie that I rented more than breaking as a kid. First of all, East Coast created break dancing. Break dancing is the pose, the floor stuff, the footwork and spinning on the heads and all those abstract gymnastic moves. When breakdancing kind of got into the clubs, people were going to clubs, people from New York came to clubs in LA and introduced it, and all around the world, people were like, whoa, they're dancing on the floor. It was a whole nother art form. But California had locking, you know, with the lockers, you know, soul train, you know, we had other dances, you know, uh, the Cupid show. We, we, Cali always had our swag. Around that time, we have popping, you know, popping. You can look at um, some of the older, older uh, groups that used to dance on Pier 39, Granny, Granny and the Robotrucks, you know. All in LA, the schools like Hoover, Long Beach, Jordan, Poly, I mean, Compton, I mean, everywhere, they, every school had like their pop lockers. You know, California knows how to party. West Coast Pop Lock was an actual song written by Ronnie Hudson. 
that actually told what was going on. If you hit that song, instead of California Love, which was a sample of West Coast Pop Lock, if you listen to Ronnie Hudson's West Coast Pop Lock, it kind of gives you a correct, theoretically correct hip hop timeline of what was going on in California because people were known as Pop Lock. They Pop Lock, woo! Pop Locking on Broadway every day. Big don't hit, you know. The thing is, Pop Locking and Boogalooing, that was the thing that we did. Some people kind of did the disco and they did the thing, but we had that unlocking. So by the time Breakdancing came, we had like a fusion. I would say 1980. If you look at the documentary Breaking and Entering by Topper Peru, which featured an early Ice T. So the thing is, our West Coast hip hop documentary, Breaking and Entering, pretty much was ground zero of ushering in our version of hip hop, our interpretation, West Coast interpretation, and New York how Wild Style. Wild Style was the New York East Coast hip hop cultural introduction to their interpretation. So breaking and entering and wild style in the 80s kind of created offspring. Great DJs, great MCs, Ice-T. Ice-T was a rapper from the West Coast, but he was at the Radio Toronto, 7th and Colorado. You know, right there, yo, check it out. This is Tracy Moore, I'm Ice-T. I do what I do. Yo, yeah, it, it peeps this, people. So the thing is, Ice-T, you know, Kid Frost, you know, uh, this is for the Raza Thun. Kid Frost from East LA, Tony G, Mellow My Ace. Yeah. I'm like, check this out, baby. Mellow My Ace, you know, is like a brother from another mother in the arts because after all is said and done, to be able to talk to these pioneers in the arts and us have camaraderie, we speak on the level of, wow, man, look at this thing from the West Coast that we built, and yet we put our egos aside and we work together and support each other. The thing is, in the last few years, of course, age comes with it. I realize it's not really about breaking or it's not about turbo and ozone. What turbo and ozone opened the doors for was worldwide for people to look at East LA. They were filmed in East LA and Whittier and our culture of hip hop here, okay, as opposed to people, you know, saying that, that breaking was a knockoff from Beat Street. But let's talk about breaking. Is it a true representation of what was going on in Los Angeles at that time? A lot of it was, and a lot of it wasn't. This is Hollywood we're talking about guys right this is hollywood you know what hollywood does they dress stuff up a little bit they put polka dots where they're not needed no a lot of that was obviously a little campy a little corny and a little hollywoody but there was a big breaking scene going on in los angeles i do remember being a kid up until a certain age when it started to fade out about 85 86 you were not break dancing you know what i mean it was all about skateboarding after that but I remember seeing people break dance in Long Beach. I tried to break dance. Everybody tried to break dance. I tried to dress like the people in breaking. I thought the way they dressed in this movie was so cool. But you know what? It wasn't nobody like wasn't nobody dressing like that in LA. Like it was just from uh, from other people I've heard, it it was they weren't really dressing in the pastels, you know what I'm saying? And things like that that they portrayed in the movie but i thought they they i thought it was so cool the way they were dressing i remember being a kid and wanting to bang the white chick lucinda dickey i used to laugh at her last name as a immature little boy and i still laugh at it as a damn near 50 year old man lucinda dickey i, I wanted to give her my dickey like she bat you back then and even watching it today I'm, I'm i have some footage in the background as i'm talking to you guys and yeah she can get it she can get it in her little leotards is that what they call them the leotards that the 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 tight pants in the 80s with the bright yeah she can get it she can definitely get it the ultimate show with kelly ozone and turbo white girl two black guys form a dance group why do they form this dance group because turbo and ozone went to a battle and they got smoked they lost big time why did they lose because the other crew electro rock which i used to think electro rock was cooler than turbo and ozone i was always rooting for the bad guy like i would i wanted iron Sheik to beat hulk hogan you know that was always me but i used to like electro rock but they lost because electro rock they brought this chick in there man and she was doing all kind of helicopter shit and she was she was she smoked ozo and ozone and turbo 
So what do they decide to do? We'll get a girl of our own. Not only any girl, but this little white girl right here who goes to this dance class down the street. So they get Lucinda Dickey and they call her. So the crew ends up being called TKO, Turbo Kelly. A more wider name. And Ozone, Turbo Kelly Special K, which was her name, and Ozone. So they form this group and they want their revenge man they want their revenge at electro rock so you know throughout the movie they do battles and things like that and then there's you know some uh some some relationship stuff that goes on between tur between ozone and uh lucinda dickey i just gotta say her name i'm sorry special k and a lot of that i fast forwarded as a kid i was only concerned with the dancing like i only wanted to see the dancing dude so i was just like please can we skip forward you know to the dancing but the battles man the battles in this movie i really enjoyed them and there's always been this it's always been this debate beach street or breaking breaking or beach street which one's better beach street or breaking breaking or beach street i'm from the west coast so i'm very biased when it comes to that but not only that Breaking takes me back to my childhood, so I got to side with Breaking. I appreciate Beach Street. I like Beach Street. I'm actually going to do a, a whole episode on Beach Street in the near future. I like Beach Street is dope, but that's what the East Coast was going through. Beach Street, for the record, was New York's way of living, and that's how they live and more power to them. But in California, yeah, we have the ocean, the playa, vamos a la playa. You know, we have the, the chile verde and the carne asada and the low riders, ah, you know, the guacabola, salsita, <laughs> ah. You know, we have that swagger, that Latino swagger, and it shows in the movie. The thing is, and the thing is, Electro Rock had people from other parts of East LA. We had some pretty intense influences just because California has it like that. And the thing is, I hate it when people say, okay, Beat Street was better. Or you know what? It's not who was better. It's just different interpretations. Breaking told a little bit more of our story. And something else that I noticed in Breaking was, even as a kid watching it, I'm like, oh, that looks like my neighborhood. And I'll be damned. A lot of it was filmed in places that I would walk to or my mom would drive me to or anything. I mean, it was placed in, you know, East LA, Whittier, Montebello, like all those areas because Breaking was everywhere. It was all over L.A., but they did a really good job of portraying where in L.A. was like, I literally was like, oh, that looks like my neighborhood. So that's why I guess I should say I relate more to Breaking than I do to Beach Street. But it's a classic movie, Beach Street as well. You comment down below. Let me know what do you prefer, Breaking or Beach Street? And you can't say both. Just pick one. I picked one. I said Breaking. Even though I love both movies and I know both movies pretty much by heart, I still love Breaking just a little bit more for the nostalgic factor. Before we move on, I'm going to ask you guys to hit that like button. If you have not already, please smash that like button. Hit it, hit it, hit it. I really need you guys to please help me out with that because there's nothing more than that helps out my channel than you hitting that like button and if this is your first time joining the channel and you like what you hear please hit that subscribe button and also if you are feeling a little bit generous there is a dollar sign right there in the live chat you can hit that dollar sign and throw your boy a few dollars if you're watching after this is live you can super thanks me which what they call it you can send me a super thanks you can send me money while the show is already posted so i just appreciate it. i just want you to know that i'm not too proud to you know beg or whatever i'm not begging i'm just saying i appreciate you guys and hey keep it coming real talk please 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 when that script came out it was an israeli production canon films it wasn't a black production it wasn't a puerto rican production they said you know what well, we're gonna do a movie but we just kind of see how it goes and sure enough they put the word out and a lot of people i think over a, a few hundred people auditioned for those roles when we went in i remember they were pairing people okay let me put this person with that. And they were trying to find Turbo and Ozone. We didn't have that problem because when me and Shabadoo came in, they went, that's Turbo and Ozone. 
I naturally have a hyper personality when I'm happy. It just happens. I came in there as Boogaloo Shrimp to some Israeli people, and they're going, Shrimp? What is it? Look, look at my name, Boogaloo Shrimp. Sounds like something from, from, from Louisiana that's like extra crispy, but Boogaloo Shrimp. Then, it, then a Puerto Rican named Shabadoo, to people from Israel, they were like, Shabadoo and Shrimp. But those were our stage names. But Turbo and Ozone kind of reminded them of our personalities. Shabadoo came in with, yeah, you know, I'm a doll from Quinones and yeah, I'm, I'm a sex symbol. So he was kind of in the Ozone. He was just Ozone status. Turbo was hyper, like, yeah, 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 you know. The fact that I kind of still had comedic timing just took the movie zero to 60 because they said, damn, you know what? We couldn't even write a better script. Let's just put them in situations. So the thing is, the movie was pretty much improv. I mean, if the pages were changing each day because once they had us, they could not write a better movie. They said, just let this be like a biopic. Let these guys do their thing. Michael Boogaloo Shrimp, a.k.a. Turbo from Breaking. One of my favorite interviews, one of my first big interviews, I would say, you know, I would say to this day, that's probably, you know, one of my one of my bigger interviews when it comes to hip hop and pop culture. I appreciate what Michael Boogaloo Shrimp, a.k.a. Turbo, has done for the culture. And it was definitely an honor. Definitely an honor interviewing him. But it's so crazy to me, man. 40 years. I can't believe this movie is 40 years old. 1984. Oh, time is moving too, too fast. Is, am I the only one who feels like time is just, time is moving crazy fast? Like, way too fast for my life. I don't remember time moving this fast 20 years ago. Do y'all? Am I tripping? Like, it's Friday. It's always Friday. I don't even get excited for Fridays anymore because it's always Friday. Now, like, it seems like life is just moving too fast. And if there's one thing I've learned, especially just in the past couple few years, is to live life to the fullest and to live every day damn near like it's your last. You know, you kind of got to unfortunately have that mindset. You got to have that mindset. Don't put shit off. If you love someone, tell them you love them. If you don't like someone, don't hang around with them. Just disappear. Like, don't don't make room. Don't make <clears throat> time for BS people. Someone's wasting your time and you realize, you know what? This person ain't doing S for my life. This person ain't doing shit for me. Let, uh, depart from that person, bro. This is just me talking now. This ain't nothing to do with breaking. This is just me as an old man. Old man Dusty. Old man Dusty sharing my thoughts with you guys. Dude, just if you love somebody, tell them. If you don't like somebody, tell them the F off, basically. <laughs> but that's my uh, little spiel. Let's keep going. Let's go back to the movie. But yes, breaking... All right, so you guys remember Canon Films? Canon Films, I think, is the ones that, am I mistaken? Is Canon Films the one that produced this? Canon Films, yes, man. Do you guys remember Canon Films? Were they like an indie type of, I think they were like an indie sort of type of, of, of label, but they label of a movie company, but they ended up producing some movies that, you know, really just, you know, were, were hits. I mean, they did some Chuck Norris movies. They did uh, Rambo, right? They did some Rambo movies. They did a bunch, just a bunch of random movies. And, of course, Breaking. And we can't talk Breaking without talking Breaking 2. Electric Boogaloo. Breaking 2 was a little more... They tried to get the Hollywood aspect because they didn't think that that that, that breakdancing would last, so they just rushed the movie and they bought these theater people, one singlers. We need something big. We need pastels. This is the ghetto. We need some brights and we need papers. <laughs> and bathrooms over here. The yeah, people now on Turbo and Ozone, we were subjected to the Hollywood machine. Mm. That's why people say Breaking was better than Breaking Two because yeah. you can see it. Yeah, big old elaborate elaborate uh, Broadway shows, uh, stage shows in Boyle Heights. But at the end of the day, the best thing about Breaking 2, they added color to the ghetto. We came back to the neighborhood not trying to be Prada, Dada, you know, you know, or, or, or bring a Gucci main kind of attitude. We came back to the barrio to make stage productions 
for a charitable cause to help the people and we keep it in the hood. So if people kind of look beyond the script and quit dumping on it, it actually kind of like gave hope to some kids. They're like, yeah, you know what? I may not be over here in Beverly Hills or whatever, but I'll make my bottle of my Beverly Hills. I'll, I'll shine my car the best I can in car wash. Breaking two resembled just wor people working together, even though we're different races, you could be Chicano, Asian, it don't matter. We dance and we, you know, we provide for our families. This is now not just a hip hop movie. This movie, and it, hip hop wasn't even the title back then. That's why they didn't call it, if you look at, it was street dance. They always said street, they didn't call it hip hop. So, the, or, or dubs that it was, it was a dance movie, but they realized, okay, now when he did that broom scene, it took it from the streets to the stage. And the guy that staged it, he was from the original West Side Story. Hyman Rogers, he said, wow, this is turning into- A ghetto West Side Story. A ghetto West Side Story. Yeah. And I was doing my best version of Fred Astaire. Yeah. Fred Astaire danced in Royal Wedding and did that dance with the coat rack. Now I'm doing my little shtick right there on Melrose and Hitler trope in Hollywood. And somehow or another with the right editing and the right music, it turned out yeah. to be a a, a very respected hip hop theatrical piece. Now, this is what I'm tripping out. I just did my job back then, but I had no idea that I was actually being known as one of the first to do a hip hop theatrical piece. Breaking two, I could just imagine the, the Hollywood executives after breaking one became a hit and made $40 million. They're like, oh my God, guys, we need to do part two. Let's do part two. Hurry up before the before the wave. Let's let's jump on this wave. And they threw together a movie called Breaking to Electric Boogaloo. And in my opinion, the only good thing about Breaking to Electric Boogaloo was that beautiful Latina chick that Turbo was chasing throughout the movie. You remember her? What happened to her? Oh, my God. The girl with the curly hair. She was so beautiful. So beautiful. You know, I've been searching for her literally for years. Like if I try, I'm I, if. Oh my God, I wish I could get an interview with her. I don't know. She just disappeared. That was her only thing in the Hollywood limelight. She was, that was her thing. And she disappeared. But y'all remember Breaking 2. If you know Breaking 2, there was a, there was a Hispanic chick dancing on stage when Turbo goes to the park and there's a bunch of chicks dancing on stage and she's the one that stood out. And I'm just like, oh, she was delicious as a kid. I remember thinking she is delicious. And as a six-year-old, I would love a taste of her. I just remember thinking that. She was one of the first girls I had a crush on was that that is that Hispanic chick that was in Breaking 2. But Breaking 2, man, they did a little too much for Breaking 2. A little too much. But wait, before we go, how could I even talk about Breaking 2 and not talk about Club Radiotron? Club Radiotron was a real place in Los Angeles, but it was known as club radio they added the tron for i don't know because hollywood likes to do dumb shit like that so they added the tron it was club radio and it was in fact this club where the youth went to dance and to battle and to show off their skills radio tron was on 7th and alvarado near echo park the brainchild of radio tron was like okay you know what I don't care what bottle you're from, you know, you come from South Bay, you come from San Fernando, you come from San Diego, wherever, there's going to be a place where you could come in, there won't be any alcohol people set tripping or whatever, and we can network and meet people and you could flex your muscle as a DJ. There wasn't a place that people could safely go without getting jumped or jacked, right? Be like, hey, dog, you got to get out of here because I just got busted off. You know, the thing is, there was a different time. So at that time in the 80s, that was a special place because we didn't have any trouble like that. If you dance and came in peace, we could have made all these really cool people. Matter of fact, what was really cool, I heard Madonna, when Madonna was starting her career, she came from wherever she was to the Radiotron and was there for a while to kind of get the feel of what the music was when she was dating Jelly Bean Benitez. So Ice T, uh, Egyptian Lover, a lot of the really serious hip hop West Coast people, when they came to Radiotron, they pretty much had a place to flex their muscle and network. By the time the movie happened, the, the like once again, Canon Films did a 
did a research of what our subculture was. Where do these people dance? Where do they kind of like, where would Turbo and Ozone battle? That's what we would have battled at the Radio Tron. Mm. People battled there and a lot of stuff went under the radar because that was when On and Select TV, On and Select TV was out. Or you can get the cable channels with the rabbit ears. So that was like back in the day. So the thing is, a lot of people had those Super 8 cameras. A lot of stuff went under the radar. So for them to actually document Radio Tron, I put it on the screen. It really kind of gave us more West Coast credibility. Uh, were there any issues with gangs while you guys were filming this? Like filming no. gang turkey? And you know and stuff? what? You know what? Because we have respect. Mm. They filmed it in East LA. And they realized that was the same streets where they filmed Boulevard Nights. Boulevard Nights was a deep gang movie that showed what was happening in East LA. And the thing is, that's just it's just the way that it was, period. There was no watering it down. That's East LA. And it was you you gotta respect it. So when they came back to break it too. They said, okay, you know what, Turbo and Ozone were good would be in East LA, but they would be there with respect. And we were doing stuff with the community. It wasn't about us, we were working with the community. Right now it's Casa de, de, de Casa, uh, Casa Camino. It, the Miracles building is an actual building mm -hmm. still here in Boyle Heights, you know. And the thing is, that kind of was symbolic of the disco crowd and Whittier and everything that was happening. Everybody was partying through here. So the, when it came to the gangs or anybody that was like, you know, that, that, that may have had an issue, the producer said, you know what, we're going to use a car club from this area. And the thing is, I, I'm not sure which car club they used. I think it was the Imperials. It could have been the Imperials, but they used the car club out of respect. We, since they were filming in a the neighborhood, they said, you know, I'm gonna, we're going to put the people. They use extras from the neighborhood and they use the car club. So I thought that that was very, very noble because, you know, you can't come in somebody's neighborhood and not give give something to the people. Yeah. So Breaking 2 is not only filmed in the calles or the streets of Boyle Heights and Whittier and those areas, but the thing is they actually had real people, those extras. A lot of people were from these all these areas, you know, El Sereno, Lincoln Heights, El Monte. Everybody that heard about that movie came from all the surrounding neighborhoods, you know, so it was it wasn't really a gang thing, it was a respectful thing for the community. Someone who did play at Club Radio and is portrayed in the movie before we known him as the cop guy on TV, before we knew him as the, the, the writer of colors, Ice-T, man. Ice-T was representing in that movie, him and Chris the Glove Taylor, who I also have interviewed as well on my channel. Check out some, like, if you haven't checked out my channel, y'all got to check out my channel. I got some dope interviews and I have playlists. So if you like want to check out the playlist, everything is pretty much, you know, I have music in one playlist. So all the music interviews I've done is there. I have, you know, interviews with gang members in uh, all in one folder. I have interviews with just prison content. So check out my playlist right here on my channel. You just go right there. You just go to videos and then you go to playlists and you're there. But I have some dope interviews, man. Like, especially with people from this time. Shout out to Chris the Glove Taylor. But yeah, Ice-T was, was portrayed in that. And, you know, he's told his story several times of being part of this classic movie. But yeah, man, um, Breaking 2 was not as good. And I don't think it did as well at the box office as Breaking 1 did. Yeah, Breaking One was, was pretty darn bad. It was pretty darn bad. But I don't know. I still liked it as a kid. There were scenes that I fast-forwarded to, right? I fast-forwarded to all the battles. They had a couple of good battles in there. But everything else was like, it was pretty corny to me. It was pretty corny. Oh, they're going to tear down Miracles. Miracles was the place now. I guess it took precedence of Radio Toronto. But Miracles is a real building, but it... I don't think it had anything to do with anything that they portrayed in the movie. It would, but it is a real building in LA and like there are tons of YouTube videos where people go to filming locations of classic movies and I'm sure you can find it if you really want to go see where Miracles is. I don't know why you want to, but if you want to go see where Miracles is in LA, go check it out. It's probably filled, no one in LA is probably filled up with a bunch of homeless people right now, unfortunately. Unhoused, I mean, unhoused, right? Is that what we're supposed to call them now? I don't know. I'm just trying to keep up. <sighs> but anyway, comment down below. What do you think about Breaking 1 and Breaking 2? And what are some of your memories of 1984? I see it as a great year. It was fun. I think the economy was booming. I don't know. 
but then there was a lot of stuff going on in the hood because like that's when ooh, there was a lot going on like the gangs and the 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 crack and all that yeah it, it was a good year for some probably not a good year for others i remember we had the olympics in, in la that's one thing i remember especially was the 1984 olympics especially because they did one of the events the swimming event at a pool in long beach that i used to go to so i thought that was kind of cool but anyway enough of me i'm gonna get the heck out of here but before i go i'm gonna ask you to hit that like button if you haven't already please hit that like button and um, if this is your first time joining the channel and you like what you hear please do hit that subscribe button if you are a true supporter please subscribe to me on rumble rumble is an app all you have to do is download it on your phone rumble r-u-m b-l-e and subscribe to dusty vision tv it's all one word dusty vision tv all one word subscribe to me on rumble i'm really trying to build that arena over there because i would love in a perfect world to take all of you over to rumble so dusty vision tv on rumble all one word but wait there's more if you're on instagram i know you're all on instagram follow me dusty vision radio on instagram and if you are an old fogey like myself i am on facebook and i have a pretty popping facebook group and i post there pretty often you can check that out dusty vision tv on facebook and lastly i know this is a lot of shit and i know you probably already tuned out by now but I'm gonna ask you to subscribe to my second channel right here on YouTube. It's Dusty Vision Radio on YouTube. I'm at almost 3,000 subscribers and I'm really trying to build that as well. I got a lot of platforms, guys. All you have to do is ask your Alexa or your Siri to play the latest episode of Dusty Vision Radio and I'll pop up. So there's no reason why you don't listen to my show. But I do appreciate you guys. I'm gonna get the heck out of here. I'll talk to you soon. Peace.